People of God, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. A welcome to all to worship this day. We're pleased that you've gathered with us here at Christ Lutheran, either in person or that you will be viewing us later. God is always present when we worship. Also this morning, we welcome our supported missionaries from World Mission Prayer League. Uh, Pastor Charles is up here, and Anita is back with her family in the back of the church there. Um, they're currently based out of the uh, Canada office, and we will hear more from Pastor Charles later in the service, and they'll be more around after worship to share and greet and reconnect with folks. For those of you that may not know, Anita is also a daughter of this congregation. And uh, happy Father's Day to all of you that have that beautiful designation, whether it is by a birth, by a, a, a gathering of folks around you, and to be a part of this day. You are so special to us. And before we join our voices together this morning to sing our gathering hymn, let us just take a moment to close our eyes, to gently breathe in, <coughs> and to breathe out and to prepare our hearts for the Holy Spirit to gather again. God, I invite you to stand in body or spirit as we join our voices together in the opening words of faith. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who greets us in this and every season, whose word never fails, whose promise is sure. Amen. And let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of our neighbors. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned, we have hurt our community, we have squandered our blessings, we have hoarded your bounty. In the name of Jesus, forgive us and grant us your mercy. Righteous God, we confess that we have sinned, we have failed to be honest. We have lacked the courage to speak. We have spoken falsely. In the name of Jesus, forgive us and grant us your mercy.
people of God, receive the good news. God is a cup of cold water when we thirst. God offers boundless grace when we fail. Claim the gift of God's mercy. You are freed and forgiven in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank Thanks be to God. of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, and also with you. And let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you have called your people to bear witness to the world, to the good news of Jesus. Inspire us to trust your leading, and enable us to be faithful to that calling. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I invite you to be seated. And I'll also invite any children that would like to come forward to, with a message for me to. Sorry, Neil, I didn't tell you. <laughs> come on up, friends. Yeah. How is everyone today? Good, good, good. Why, why don't you pick those all up? Could you do that? Thanks. Oh, no, don't help him. I asked him to do it. Hmm. You know, Jesus is going to talk about today that he says these words. He says, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. How are you doing there? Good. I, th I think there's some up and over here, too. You got them? Okay, great. Hmm. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Are you feeling like the laborers are few right now? People doing the work? What if those ladies helped you? Maybe you ladies should help him. There's some over there. You can find some back there. There's one down here. It, how's that feeling? Is it feeling a little better? Yeah. Because when we all work together, things go a lot better, right? Uh-huh. I don't know about you, but when I had to clean my room, I didn't want to clean it by myself because you know what? Somebody else slept in that room with me. And I used to get so mad at my sister because she'd be like playing with a toy in the corner and I'd be cleaning our room because mom said, go clean your room. And if I was doing it by myself, how did I feel? Lonely, Lonely and a little mad. Oh, I was like, why isn't she helping? Because I knew if she did it, it would go a lot faster, right? 
And that's what Jesus is saying too. He says, you know, there's people out in this field because there was no tractors, there was no auto steer, there was no good combines, there was no precision planting options. And they were out there working so very hard in those fields. But if there were only a couple of people that showed up to plant the whole field by themselves, and then only a couple of people that showed up to pull up all of the stuff and to pick all the cobs off of, those, uh, off of the corn stalks, it took a long time, right? Exactly. She said, if I saw that, I would run and get more friends and go help them. It was much better when they all, all of these friends helped you, right? Should we do it again? No. <laughs> Maybe not, right? But Jesus is saying that if there's only a few people out in the field doing all of that work by themselves, the laborers are few. The laborers means the workers are few. So, just like, just like you just said, Miss Nora, right? You should have lots of friends to help you to do the work, right? And Jesus is saying, I need lots of friends to tell people about me. And Jesus said, I also need a lot of friends to love on everybody. Because one person, it's a lot of work. But love, no matter how little or how much, is just so amazing, right? Yeah, exactly. I'd rather you have all of these people out here loving on you than just me, because it's so much better. It's still good, but it's so much better, right? Yeah. Will you pray with me this morning? Let's pray no more cards go flying. Okay. <laughs> Gracious God, we thank you for the gift of Jesus, the one who has shown us how to love each other, how to help each other. But we know that if we are not helping others to know about that, it is an important task, an important work to do. We're grateful for your example. And all of God's people said, Amen. Thanks for coming up, friends. Just making sure there's no more cards. <laughs> The reading is from the book of Exodus, the 19th chapter. At Sinai, God assured Israel, you shall be my treasured possession, and commissioned them to serve as mediating priests for the nations. The people commit themselves completely to God's will. Beginning with the second verse, they had journeyed from Rephidim, entered the wilderness of Sinai and camped in the wilderness. Israel camped there in front of the mountain. Then Moses went up to God. The Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob and tell the Israelites, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be treasured possession out of all the peoples. Indeed, the whole earth is mine, and you shall be for me a priestly kingdom and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the Israelites. So Moses came, summoned the elders of the people, and set before them all these words that the Lord had commanded him. The people all answered as one. Everything that the Lord has spoken, we will do. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. The reading is from the book of Romans, the fifth chapter. We are no longer God's enemies, but have peace with God, because we are brought into the right relationship with God through Christ's death. Beginning with the first verse. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God 
through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to his grace in which we stand. And we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. Not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. And endurance produces character. And character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us and that while we still were sinners, Christ died for us. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Please rise in body or spirit. The Holy, Go- Sorry. the Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the ninth chapter. Glory, Glory to you, o Lord. The mission of Jesus' followers is to continue the mission of Jesus himself. Here he instructs his first disciples as to how they might proclaim the gospel through their word and deeds. Beginning at the 35th verse. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them for they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Then Jesus summoned his twelve disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and cure every disease and every sickness. These are the names of the twelve apostles. First Simon, who is known as Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew the tax collector, James the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon the Cananean, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles, and enter no town of the Samaritans, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaiming the good news, the kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You have received without payment, give without payment. The Gospel of the Lord. Lord God, I pray that you will give me your words to speak this morning. Christ, you will be that word which goes forth to our hearts. In spirit, you will take that word and set it on fire. Amen. (coughs) So, happy Father's Day. And I'm really tempted to tell some dad jokes, because Anita knows how much love. We were telling, we were out last night with a bunch of the Olson family, and we, we got some of them, but... I I thought, you know, if you want to do the dad jokes, you can do it afterwards during coffee time. But there's just, it just, it was was too much of a good setup with the Moses story at the beginning. So I thought there was these uh, um, three guys, uh, Moses, Jesus, and this old man who went out golfing. And uh, they went out golfing and um, Moses, he tees off and he hits the ball and it goes and it lands in the water. So Moses stands at the edge of the water, holds up his hands, the water parts, and he walks down into the bottom of the pond and he plays it out of there. And uh, Jesus, well, he goes along and he hits and he tees off, yep, again, in the water. So Jesus walks down to the pond, walks across the water, 
and plays it off the top of the water. Well, the old man, he's sitting there going, oh, what am I going to do? Yeah, so the old man, he tees it off. Sure enough, lands in the water. Lands in the water, as it lands in this water, a fish comes along and grabs the ball. Grabs it, and, and he's swimming away with the ball, and they're all going, shaking their heads. And then this eagle comes down, swoops down, grabs the fish, lifts <coughs> up the swish, goes flying off with the fish and the ball. As the fish is flying across the green, the fish drops the ball, lands in the green, hole in one. Jesus walks up to the old man and goes, way to go, Father. <laughs> So you can have a little dad joke comp competition afterwards, but uh, we're grateful for the fathers here. Uh, it is a wonderful gift, uh, father, being fathers and mothers, uh, parenting children, um, it, and it, it really does fit in with our text. Being uh, fathers and mothers, carers of children, is actually how we need to, how we need to work in the church. I think it's, when we talk about this calling of disciples, and I've talked to we a few weeks ago, we had, uh, for, was it Trinity Sunday, we had Matthew 28. He said, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, and the call to make disciples. And I remember I was at one congregation, and I said, okay, Jesus, because the, the command there is not go, the command is actually make disciples, or actually disciple the nations. So I said, okay, so Jesus tells us all we're supposed to make disciples. So how many of you are making disciples in the congregation? And this was quite a large congregation. It's like, yeah, the pastor, a couple of elders maybe, stick up the hand and everybody's going, oh, I'm not doing that. And I'm just going, okay, I've just stuck my foot in my mouth. So I said, how many of you are parents? Okay, how many of you are parents? A few of you? You are disciple makers. And in fact, this is really, when, when I get this picture, having gone and worked in Africa, worked in Mongolia, worked in Canada as a pastor. Disciple making is not a program we put on at our church. When I was, I went back to Africa in 2018 to visit, um, to visit some folks there, I met a young man who I'd mentored uh, on his road to becoming a pastor. And he, when we sat down and talked, and I was with a couple other people, and we traveled for about five, six hours in a vehicle, and we was talking. As he was recounting to me the things, I mean, he was sharing with other people about what his relationship with me meant to the other folks who were in the car. The stories he told were not the profound teachings and Bible studies that I led with him. That was not what he talked about. The stories that he told were when we ate together, when Anita and I and him ate together. The stories that he told was how some of the things that happened to us along the path and the journey from one village to another. And it really struck me, discipling is not just having a Bible study. Discipling is breaking bread together, which we're going to do. But it's actually breaking the bread together at home. It's inviting. It's parenting. And you know what? If you've ever uh, shared Christ with somebody and had the joy of them coming to faith, when you walk with them in life, it's actually a lot like having children. Because new believers are sometimes really messy. They kind of do. Th and you know what? As much as it's crazy and you just go, oh, man, I can't. There's other times when you just stand back and go, wow, look at that. I'm so glad to have walked together with this young believer. And it's so much like raising children and just about as long. Well, even Paul himself, after he became a believer when, uh, when the spirit came on and he went blind and then he got baptized, it was a number of years in the wilderness. It doesn't happen all at once. And I think sometimes we think when we share our faith, oh, it needs to happen all at once. You need to get up and your life needs to be changed. We hear, remember when we used to share some of these testimonies back in the 70s and 80s, for those of you older, and you talk about, oh yes, this happened and I quit sm smoking and I quit drinking and I did this and my whole life was changed and it was amazing. That's not really what, I mean, sometimes the, it is a gift of the spirit that we, we get some of these struggles taken away from us quite quickly. But more often than not, it's a journey, like raising your children. And often you don't necessarily see it until you actually look back, like raising your children. They don't always get it the first time you tell them, don't do that. And I think that that's true. As we walk together, we're sometimes hard on each other. And I know as a pastor, I don't know how it is for you, PJ, but for myself, 
I actually really enjoyed, we, in, our, in our personage when I was in Canada, I really enjoyed the fact that they left some things unfinished because I enjoyed carpentry. Because it's really nice to do something and you actually, when you do it, it gets done and it stays done. Because when you're pastoring, you go and you talk to people and you think it's done and next day it's just, like nothing was said. But is that like parenting? Have you told your kids something and it's like it did not sink in at all? And yet you don't give up. You stick with it. And that's, I believe, the call that we're called to walk together as disciple makers. Then Jesus went about the cities and villages. Actually, then Jesus went about all the cities and villages. When, we, when, when Matthew writes this, he gives us an indication, this is the scope of Jesus' ministry. It's all the cities and villages. Is it hyperbole? I would probably say, well, he didn't hit them all, but maybe he did hit them all. But certainly Matthew wants to give us this emphasis that he didn't miss anybody. There's, there is a, um, a, 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 not a myth, but a, a, a story about the 12 disciples after Jesus left and whatever it is that they sat down and they cast lots for the 12 different parts of the world because they wanted to make sure no part was missed. Because they said, everybody needs to. Has, we, we, God has a desire that they hear the gospel. Jesus went about all the cities and villages. And then this is the ministry he did. Teaching their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and curing every disease and illness. And Matthew, we see this theme reoccurring a few different times. He says, he's teaching, he's uh, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and curing every disease and illness. And it's actually really rather interesting because we, even as we get into chapter 10, we're going to see he gives some of this away quite quickly. He tells, he's, he's going to see in Matthew, Matthew chapter 10, he says, and he gives them the authority to do what? To proclaim the good news that the kingdom of heaven is at hand and to cure every illness and disease. He actually, interestingly enough, doesn't give them the teaching part. But where does he give them the teaching part? As I said, actually after his resurrection, where he says, go therefore make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded. So I get the feeling that this teaching bit needed a resurrection power, but also needed to see what, what the power of Christ was, that it's not, just, it's not just a philosophy to change your way of being. It's not just, oh, the kingdom of heaven is high. It actually has the power, quite literally, to raise the dead. And so the, the teaching part comes in at the end of his ministry before he goes. And so he hands it off. And then we get, this, this, this is the powerful part that I want, for me, I want to hold a little bit closer to. When he saw the cross. So this is the impetus. This is, this is the reason why Jesus does what he does. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. Because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. When he, saw, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. And I think, you know, that this drives God. This drives God. I mean, we see in Philippians, uh, uh, Philippians chapter 2. For he did not count equality with God something to be grasped, but emptied himself and took upon himself the nature and form of a servant. And he came down to us. This is like, it's like the father and the son were having this conversation in heaven, and they look down at what's happening on the earth, and he goes, the harassed. Things are going, and this harass, this word in the Greek, this word harass is like they were, they were being whipped, they were being beaten, they had lacerations on them. This is a pretty nasty word. He looks down and he says, things are not going well for these sheep. Things are not going well for us. And so he says, he has compassion on them to walk with. And this idea, I mean, in English, the word compassion is to mean to have passion with. And passion is this word to suffer. He, he wants to walk and suffer. And we sang in the song that we, that we suffer with and that suffering has power. I mean, we read in the, in the, in the um, epistle lesson, what's, we, we endure suffering because it produces endurance. And it, it's, it's not necessarily bad to suffer, but it's not something we seek. Jesus has compassion on them. 
And I think with that, when we have compassion on people, we see with different eyes. I don't know how about if this is true for you, but I know it's true for me. Because sometimes I feel judgmental. Like, I can't believe that that person is. I see an action that they're doing, and I feel judgmental. It reminds me about a story on a bus. And uh, this father and this son get on the bus. And they get in, and they sit down on the bus. The dad sits down, and he's just kind of sitting there like he's had a hard day at work. And the kid is running up and down the bus. And he's tugging on people, and he's poking people, and he's being rude and annoying. And people in the bus are getting annoyed. And they're going, Dad, do something. Dad, do something. This is your job as a parent. And finally, and everybody, and, and this guy says, you know what, I, I kind of look around, and nobody's doing anything. Everybody's kind of looking down, ignoring this, but you can see the tension is rising in the bus. And finally, this guy says, nobody else is going to say something. I'm going to say something to the father. And he gets up, walks over to the father, and he says, sir, sir. And the guy looks up at him like this and goes, sir, um, your son is running around. And he goes, yeah, yeah, sir, and he goes, thanks for looking after him. We just are coming home from the hospital, and his mom died, and I don't know what I'm going to do. The whole spirit in that bus changed. It wasn't a father ignoring a son not being a good father. It was a father and son grieving. Compassion, we see with different eyes. God calls us to see with different eyes. And this, to me, is central in who we need to identify. It's why Anita and I do some of the things we do, go to the end of the world, because we begin to see with different eyes. I don't know if you know, you talked about Anita being a daughter of this congregation. When Anita was eight years old, and I don't know if, how many people from the congregation, if it was just the Olson family that went, but they went to Bible camp. And when they went to this Bible camp, and it was a small camp, and it was a mission camp, and they always talked about mission things. And somewhere at the end of the camp, the missionary, after uh, giving this speech about what they're doing, he left, and one of the kids came and wrote on the blackboard, and he says, when I'm older, I will be a missionary. And then a whole bunch of different kids came and started to write their name on the blackboard. And it's like the Holy Spirit was saying, I want to be a person who sees with these missionaries. So, and Anita says, she knew at that moment, at, at, at eight years old, she says, I want to be a missionary. So she's got this driving, like, I knew when I married her, I, I, I better be a missionary, or this marriage isn't going to go real well. In fact, I had a pastor tell me, we, I was pastoring in Canada, he says, Charles, you said you were going to be a missionary, and you're still sticking here on in Canada. You need to get up and go. So we're in Africa, and we had gone to the place where we were going to go minister in Africa. And the, we, we were taken into the village, and the guy, the missionary who was kind of our supervisor there, said, well, we're going to figure out a place where you can go. So he drives us like three hours off into the bush. And we're standing there in the bush, and the guy says, so I'm going to introduce you to this community. And the chief of the community was somewhat inebriated, and he comes walking up to us like this, and he had a rifle over his shoulder with the barrel pointing straight at us, and he's standing there saying, we would love to have you come to our mission, to our place, we would love, and Anita's just quiet, like she's kind of doing this, doing this, not wanting to stand in front of the rifle, and she's just, okay, this is not quite what I expected. And then we drive back, and the road, like you're driving 15 to 18 miles an hour the whole way back, because the roads are literally that bad. And we, about a half a mile before we get back to the mission station, I said, I need to get a walk. We, our bones were rattled. And we get out, we walk, and just go, oh man, this is, so three hours, or two hours out, two hours back, guy putting his gun at him. We go in, and we had this meal, and it was nothing but beans and corn. And it was like whole field corn that they'd boiled. 
and we're just going, okay, this is not quite enough at the end of the day. And we're just going, and it, the, the day is long, hot, rifle, beans and corn. And then before Anita says, I'm tired, I'm going to go to bed. As she gets out, and we were in a tent outside because there was no room in the house. As we start heading out, the missionary says, the, the head missionary goes, oh, check for snakes in the tent and under the tent before you go to bed. Because and especially and in the morning when you get up, be careful because sometimes they will scoot in under the tent and curl up next to you. I come into the tent afterwards, and Anita's crying in the tent. She says, "I don't know if I can do this." From eight years old to now, she's been prepared. She did everything to go. I don't know if I can do this. So we ended the night. The next morning I got up and says, you know what, Anita? I don't think we can do this. But God can. And Anita said at that moment, her prayers changed. We were always praying for the people that we went to, that we would be able to minister. Anita's prayer changed, and she, her prayer changed to say, Lord, let me see them with your eyes. And this has become our prayer, not just on the mission field, but in our neighborhood, sometimes even for our family. Lord, let me see them with your eyes. It's this compassion. It's seeing them the way God sees them. It's seeing, and sometimes we don't know the whole story. And so sometimes we don't know the heart of God as to why he allows things to happen. But it's trusting him enough when we see them with his eyes that we see them as harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. And even the people that come across and they bluster and they're in your face and whatever, they're sheep without a shepherd. And then he tells the disciples, the harvest is plentiful. And this word harvest is plentiful is kind of a, well, you know what, when the harvest time is there, it's kind of this, there's a, there's a drive. Something needs to happen. The harvest is ready. we got to be ready. If you haven't changed the oil in the combine and greased it up and fixed the rasp bars and done all that, you're behind. The harvest is plentiful. There's an urgency to this. And then he says, but the laborers are few. And there's not enough to go. The harvest is too big and we've only got a few people. And when I, when, this is a key theme verse for our organization. And I say, so the harvest is plentiful, the laborers are few, therefore go and make disciples. That's not what it says. What does it say? The harvest is plentiful, the laborers are few, therefore, come on, folks. Therefore, what does it say? Ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Yeah, to pray, to pray. To ask, to ask the Lord. All too often, and maybe this is a guy thing, maybe Anita doesn't do as much, I don't know, PG, the guy thing is, oh, I've got to fix it. Right? And, that's it. and you know what, I think most of the problems in U.S. and Canada, and I would say around the world, but particularly we see this, is we see a problem and we want to fix it. I was speaking with a young person at the camp, and they said, I really want to stand with the helpless. I really want to stand with the disenfranchised. And, and you know, all too often, we see people who need help, and we jump in to fix it. Two key books that are kind of reshaping our organization are When Helping Hurts and We Are Not the Hero. And all too often, we go in thinking we're helping, and it hurts. It actually destroys more than it helps. Or we go in thinking with our money that we're going to fix it. We go in with our ideas saying, we're going to fix it. And this is, I think, the key reason why in this verse, this should be a driving verse. The harvest is plentiful. The labors are few. There's an urgency. Yes, we have compassion. Yes, something has to be done. And the first thing he says is, turn your eyes on Christ. Ask. Take your eyes off your own solution. Take your eyes off of what you think will help. Take your eyes off and ask God, I don't see with your eyes. Ask God, let me look 
let me do what you would do. And you know what the difficulty, especially for me, is? Sometimes it's to be quiet. It's to walk with. Do we allow bad things to happen because we don't accept it? Sometimes we do. It's not our desire. But it's asking with wisdom because you know what? When I think I'm going to help somebody who's in a bad place and I go in and fix it, there's a whole bunch of ramifications that I don't see what happens. And it's parenting. Like, do you step in and say, don't do that? And it's the third time, you know, don't pull the cat's tail. Don't pull the cat's tail. Okay, the cat will figure this one out with the kid. It's not easy answers. And that's why we pray. We don't want bad things to happen. We don't like it when people are trod on. And so we're called out of ourselves to walk with them. Some of the things that I've seen in other places, some of the things I've seen in our own country are distressing, and they should distress us. We should have compassion. We should, and yet, let's always ask, Lord, what would you have me do? I'll finish with, with this story. And I may have told it here, but I'm going to tell it again in so we had one of the elders were in Samburu, and he had come to faith. Uh, the young man who I was, who was the, inter, uh, the uh, intern pastor who I was working with and mentoring, he'd come to faith, and we were getting ready for baptism classes, and we were doing that, and he's getting ready to be baptized, and as we're sitting down with him, we're, he's saying, okay, so when I get baptized, um, uh, I, I see that you, there's kind of a, yeah, I, I'll be more involved in the church, he says, if I get baptized, do I have to sit on church council? I says, do you want to? No. And he says, okay. No, you don't have to sit on church council. He says, when I get baptized and become part of this church, do I have to sing in the choir? He goes, because you really don't want me to sing in the choir. And I said, no. When I get baptized, do I have to be an usher? I'm going, he's setting the bar really low now, right? <laughs> and he says, no. I'm just wondering where this is going. I says, so when you get that, so I'm going to put it back. So when you get baptized, what do you want to do? What gifts do you have? And he stops. He's an older man. And he says, I would like to bless people. In Sambudu, there's a tradition, especially an older man can walk into a uh, maniata, um, a thorn-fenced enclosure where there's a number of houses, and an older man will come in and ask to do a blessing. And he'll come in and he'll speak blessing, and, and the kids and the, and the women and the men will gather together, and he will speak blessing over them, and they respond by receiving that blessing. And he says, I would like to do this in Jesus' name. And I said, that would be And so the final verse in our text here is, says, freely you have received, freely give. Our congregation up in Canada, I don't know how you're, we're kind of trying to restart some things. And they're going through some ideas. What, could, what is God calling us to do this coming year? And I talked with a couple of different folks. And God is moving, and I, I, I'm excited to hear what God is doing in your midst. Thank you, PJ, for the leadership you give, and you are a blessing. And, and you know, I know, because we talked before, how blessed you feel to have folks in this congregation. You are doing these, doing wonderful things, and I want to encourage you. And if you don't feel like you have a place yet in ministry here, pray. But don't make it complicated what he calls you to do. It might be as simple, we had a, our youth workers stand up and saying, all you need to do, older folks, you don't know what you want, is introduce yourself to the young people and speak a word of encouragement. She says, you're avoiding them like, I don't know how to talk to them, I don't know what to do. She says, we haven't got the plague. We're not going to eat you alive. And the kids say, they feel like they have, the grandparents sometimes avoid them, or the older people, actually, not grandparents. She says, just introduce yourself. They don't know everybody. 
Speak a word of blessing. Maybe you can pray for them. Maybe you can ask them in one congregation, the simple word was, uh, grandparents were phoning up at, or texting their kids and saying, how can I pray for you this week? And not coming back with solutions to their problems and tell them, but simply pray. Freely you have received. Freely you give. Ministry is not rocket science. It actually comes out of what he has done for us. This is a wonderful gift. And I thank you. I, my wife thanks you for the congregation that you are. You continue to support us. We've got folks who are now in Tajikistan, folks who are a uh, young couple with twins going to Pakistan. We've got, I just came back from Mongolia here a month ago, and they're talking about opportunities that they're saying, the, the, the harassed and helpless, the brokenness of some of the folks that they're living in, they say, can you walk with us? And they're not saying, can you do it for us anymore? We're not actually starting things. We're participating with them. We're not even partnering. They're not saying, you can do this for us. And I'm hoping sometime, and I'm maybe at this congregation, we'll see some of them come here. I've got a Mongolian couple. I would love to see come and visit your congregation here, our congregation here. I would love to see it because they have stories to tell. And they're really, he's a musician or whatever. But he has a heart for the Inuit, people of northern Kenya. And he looks just like them. And they do throat singing. And he struggled with some of the thing, same things that they do up there. And I said, he would do way better up there than I ever could. And this is the face of mission that we're beginning to see and encourage. So have compassion, but not your compassion, God. See with God's eyes. And that out of what God has given you, say, Lord, what would you have me do? How would you have me be today so that the world might know that the kingdom of heaven has come near. Amen.
Lord God, I invite you to rise in body or spirit as we profess our faith through the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And let us pray. Trusting in God's abundant mercy, let us offer our prayers for the world in need. For the church here and around the world, we pray. Seek out missionaries and send them out with authority to proclaim God's good news bringing healing where there is pain, and counter the forces of evil. Continue to bless the ministry of Pastor Charles and Anita in their work with the World Mission Prayer League. Lord, in your mercy. For the earth and all its creatures, we pray. Equip farmers, farm workers, and all who labor on the land to produce a harvest and care for livestock. Nourish crops with ample rainfall and abundant sunshine. Repair the air, land, waters, and animals where pollution has caused harm. Just like a field of seeds, so is love. Invite our congregation and prayers of support for Caitlin and Logan Isaacson, who were married yesterday. Lord, in your mercy. For those who lead and govern, we pray. Empower those who seek peaceful solutions to conflict and embolden those who advocate for all who are oppressed. Work through systems that establish justice throughout the world. Bring food to those who are hungry. Bring habitat to those who are homeless. Bless the ministry of ELCA's World Hunger Program and the Cottonwood Food Pantry. Lord, in your mercy. You hear the cries of joy of those who celebrate and those who grieve on this Father's Day. Nurture mutual love and tender care in all relationships. Accompany those who wish to be fathers and open us to receiving your nurturing love from all who serve fathering roles in our lives. Lord, in your mercy. For those who suffer, we pray. Accompany those who feel helpless, alone, or abandoned. Embrace any who long for successful treatment, for mental illness, or freedom from addiction. Heal those who are sick, especially for Terry, Joyce, and Jim, Larry, Brad, and Kathy, Trevor, Linda, and Sam. Embrace those who are caregivers. Lord, in your mercy. For all the saints, we give thanks for lives now lived eternally. For Harold Kratzky and Dorothy Hunter, sister of Joan Schwartz. Receive in your eternal care all those who have died and fill us with hope that does not disappoint. Lord, in your mercy. Receive our prayers and answer us, O God, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you all and also with you. Take a moment and share the Lord's peace with one another.
I invite you to be seated when you are ready. A few announcements to lift up this morning. Um, first of all, there is a beautifully written article on page nine in your bulletin about World Hunger Sunday. Every third Sunday here at Christ Lutheran, we uh, celebrate and we honor and we give to World Hunger. Um, you can find envelopes at the back of the sanctuary. They are, I've got to find mine in here. Um, green, brownish color, and it says ELCA World Hunger. Give as your hearts are nudged. You can also give online. There's a designation option if you scroll down on the online giving page as well. Uh, this Tuesday is quilting, right? Yes. Quilting, um, come, enjoy, uh, learn whatever tugs at your heart to be a part of that ministry. They also spend some time together just in fellowship and to uh, lift each other up in prayer. Um, also, you'll find a big page in the back of your uh, bulletin this morning about stories in the park. We have for many years not uh, done a vacation Bible school, but my heart has been tugged on this year to do something in the summertime for our children. So on a three uh, Tuesdays, the first one will be June 26th, I'm going to be down in the uh, city park, which is the one that's on Park and Cherry Street, that corner area, and I'm just going to bring some books, and we're just going to read some stories with the children. They're not necessarily Bible stories, but they're stories of our secular world and life that teach us stories that we are taught in the Bible. So invite your friends, invite uh, your, your grandchildren, whoever might be around. Come and join me at 10 a.m. on those three, sun, uh, three Mondays listed uh, in the bulletin um, for stories in the park with our children. So um, know that that is an option. And we thank you so much for the ways that you give to this church, that you nurture others, that you love on others, and that you give so that ministry can be near and far and wide. At this time, the ushers will receive our offering. Let us pray. Living God, we give you the things that are yours, our skills, our time, our positions, ourselves. Bless us in these gifts. Move us to works of faith and labors of love for the good of all your people. Through your Lord Jesus Christ, The Lord be with you, and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks and he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance <coughs> of me. And let us pray the prayer that our Lord has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. All people are called to Christ's table. Come, eat what is good. The body of Christ given for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. I invite you to be seated and the ushers will direct you forward.
and receive the blessing of communion. Now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ and his most precious blood strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. We thank you, generous God, for the refreshment we have received at your banquet table. Send us now to spread your generosity into all of the world through the one who is our deepest treasure, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. And receive the sending blessing. The God who calls across the cosmos and speaks in the smallest seed, bless, keep, and sustain you now and to the end of age. Amen. Go in peace, share the harvest. Thank you.